All right, in this video, we're going to talk about compound probability and independent events. Let's begin by defining compound probability. This is a fairly simple concept. Compound probability just means there are multiple events, and we're trying to find the intersection of those events, meaning if we've got two events, A and B, we're trying to find the probability of A occurring and B occurring. So that's, that's the intersection. We're saying, what's the probability of both events occurring? Now, on the surface, making this calculation is fairly simple. All you're really going to do is you're going to multiply the, these two probabilities together. The challenge is that sometimes you're going to have to make an adjustment to those probabilities because they have some sort of an influence on each other. Not all the time. It has, sometimes you can just multiply the two probabilities as if you know, they were happening on their own together and you'll get the intersection of those two events. That's sometimes, some of the times you're going to have to make an adjustment. And this all has to do with whether the two events are dependent or independent. And we can define this as saying dependent events have some influence on each other. I'm going to write down these two terms because these are important. Dependent events do influence each other's outcomes, and independent events do not. Meaning, if event A occurs, it has no bearing on event B. Let's start off by talking about independent events because they're actually the simpler type of events to deal with when we're talking about compound probability. Let's think about some examples of in independent events. Well, if I have a six-sided die and I roll it once and then I roll it again, whatever I got, we'll call the first roll event A, whatever I got on my first roll has no bearing on whatever I got on my second roll, event B. So there is no relationship between those two events. You're not going to make a bet on the second roll of a die based on who you got on the first roll. They have no bearing, so those are independent events. Roll one, event A, and roll two, event B, independent. Another example. Let's say I draw a card from a deck of 52 cards. And then I put that card back, and I shuffle the deck multiple times, and I draw again. In that case, whatever I got on my first draw does not influence what I got on my second draw. Those are independent events. Uh, we can just, I mean, the, the, if I got a seven of diamonds on my first draw, and I put it back and then I shuffle everything, the chance of me getting a seven of diamonds on my second draw is the same as me getting any other card. So again, independent events. Um, you know, same would be true, just going back to that, that dice idea, um, so that we're totally clear, if I had two different dice, let's say I had a red die and a, a white die, they don't have to be different colors, but I'm just, just for the sake of simplicity, let's say I've got a red die and a white die, I roll them both together, whatever I get on each die, th those are going to be independent events. So now let's talk about how you would do this calculation. When you're talking about compound probability, you're always going to do multiplication. You're always going to multiply the events together. The key is with independent events, you don't have to make any sort of adjustments to the probabilities as you multiply them. With dependent events, you do. The equation, this is very simple, for independent events, to find their intersection in compound probability, probability of A and B, or the intersection of A and B, same thing, is the probability of event A times probability of event B for independent events. Don't have to make any adjustments, you can just take their straight probabilities and multiply them together. Let's look at this in the context of the dice that we're talking about, so a red die and a, and a blue. Um, that's what did I say, a white die and a red die. So if we said um, event A is to roll a 3 on the white die, and event B is to roll a 6 on red, then the probability, let's think about this in terms of um, our fundamental probability equation, which is you know the number of outcomes we're looking for over total possible outcomes. In this case, What's, how many outcomes are we looking for? Well, we have to roll a 3 on the white and a 6 on the red. That's only one possible outcome. That's the only way this, this can shake out where we're getting what we're looking for. 
But how many total possible outcomes do we have now? Now, it's more than just a roll on a single die. On a roll on a single die, we have six. But in, in, now that we're, have, we have a compound probability, now that we have two events, we actually have six times six total possible outcomes. We've got, we can roll any one of six numbers on the first die and any number one, uh, any one of six numbers on the second die. So essentially for, if, if we say, okay, this is white and this is red, we've got one, two, three, four, I'm gonna run out of room, five, six. Hmm. And if you roll a one on white, you've got all these possibilities for rolling something on red. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six on red. And the same thing would be true if you rolled a two on white, three on white, four all the way down. So it's six by six, so we have 36 total possibilities. So our probability of A and B here is gonna be equal to probability of rolling a three on white, which is one sixth, times probability of rolling a six on red, which is one sixth as well, equals one out of 36. Let's use a slightly different example. I'm gonna erase a little bit of this. Now I'm gonna define a new event. We're gonna say C is roll even on red. So now we have, and we're gonna look for the probability of A intersection C. So let's think about this. What's our probability of rolling uh, even on red? Well, the even numbers on a six-sided die are two, four, and six. So we're still going to use the probability of A times the probability of B. Probability of A is still three, rolling a three on, out, out of, on a six-sided die, that's still one-sixth, times probability of rolling even on red. This one has three possible outcomes we're looking for out of six. So now our probability of A intersection C is three out of 36. And that's how you do it for independent events. These are independent events. They don't influence each other. So it's, it, we can just multiply straight up. That's all we have to do. One more example having to do with dice. Um, want to take a look at the probability of rolling between the two dice getting a six. So, uh, you know, the two numbers together are adding to six. So probability of rolling a six on two dice. Now this is a little bit of a different situation. We still have the same total possible outcomes, which is six times six. And this is you know something you're always going to use when you've got two independent events and you're multiplying them together. You, when you have, you're looking for intersection, you multiply the, the sample spaces by each other to get the total possible outcome. So we still have 36. We know the probability of rolling a six on two dice is going to be 36. The question is, what do we put in the numerator? What is the number of outcomes we're looking for? For this, we have to sort of think a little bit harder. We have to think, how many ways can you get a six using a red and white die? Well, let's, let's put this down. We've got a white die here, and we've got a red die here. What are the combinations we can have? Well, we can have a one and a five. We can have a two and a four. We can have a three and a three. Or we can have a four and a two, or a five and a one. Those are one, two, three, four, five possible outcomes for rolling a six on two dice. And our denominator is the total possible outcomes that we get by multiplying six possible outcomes times six possible outcomes. So that's our answer for the probability of rolling a six on two dice. Start a new page now. I'm gonna move on to another example. Let's say in a certain state, we've got a certain way of um, putting together license plates. This is the most uneven um, digit spaces I possibly could have made, but just bear with me. There are seven spots for numbers and letters on this state's license plate. Seven spaces, and uh, you have to have a certain number of digits, zero through nine, and letters, so 26 letters in the alphabet. And they have to be in certain spaces. So space one has to have a digit, space two, three, and four have to have letters, 
And then we're going to have another digit, another digit, and another digit. I don't know if this makes any sense or not, but you understand what I'm saying here. This is the regulation for, for the license plates in this state. I completely made it up. You have to have a digit in the first place, followed by a letter, a letter, a letter, and then three more digits. So my question for you is, how many different possible combinations of license plates are there in, for this state? Well, you could get that. You'd say, these events are all independent. You know, you could assign a random, let's say these are assigned randomly. So you assign a random digit to the first place here. You assign a random letter here, another random letter here, another random letter here, digit, digit, digit. digit. The answer is you have 10 possibilities here, 0 through 9, that's 10 possibilities, times 26 possibilities, times 26 possibilities, times 26, times 10, times 10, times 10. That's equals, that equals a big number. I don't know exactly what it is off the top of my head. You can do it on, on your own. You multiply, it's, it's the product of all these possibilities. That's the number of possible combinations you can have. And if you want to figure out the probability of getting any specific combination of digits and letters, it's going to be 1 over this number. 1 over whatever the product of all of these is. I'm not going to open up Excel and do this. You can have to work it out on your own. All right. Here's a twist. What if you can only use one a, a, a letter and a digit one time, meaning there can be no repeats. There can be no repeats in this sequence of digits and letters in your license plate. That significantly complicates things. Let's think about this. Okay, in the first space, I'm going to recreate this, hopefully better this time. I think that was marginally better. All right, in the first place, you can have 10 digits, right? It's not impossible to have a repeat thus far. We haven't, we haven't assigned anything yet. And same for the second place. We can have 26 letters because, you know, there's no possibility of having had a repeat at, at this point. But in the third place, we can only have 25 possibilities because we've already assigned a letter in the second place. And in the fourth place, we can only have 24 possibilities because we've had a letter in the second place, a letter in the third place, and now, now we only have 24 letters to choose from. Similarly, in the fifth spot, we can only have nine digits. In the sixth spot, you can only have eight. And then by the seventh spot, we've already assigned one, two, three digits, so we can only have seven. And to figure out the total possible combinations here, we're going to multiply these together. So this is an example of events that are not independent. They actually do play a role in influencing each other because we've, we weren't replacing. Essentially, we were saying, you know, it's, we, we, we can't have repeats. So whatever you picked in spot two is going to influence your possible outcomes in spot three. So this is a fairly simple one to wrap your head around. You say, well, okay, I know how many possible outcomes I've got in each of these spots. So, you know, if I'm looking for the total possible outcomes, the intersection of all these events, I want to say, what's the probability of me getting one specific, what is the probability of me getting you know, three J G I two six nine. Just what? What are the random random chance of me getting that specific license plate? Well, it's going to. If you know you can't have repeats, it's going to be one over this. All right. Let's do one more example. I think I've got time for it. What if I've got a sock drawer? Actually, let me open up a new new page here. The sock drawer. And in that sock drawer, I've got eight pairs of black socks, five blue, and um, seven white. Let's say I open up that sock drawer. It's dark in my room. I reach a hand in. I'm also not looking. I run around and I pull out a pair of socks. What's the probability of that those socks being black? Well. This should be fairly easy for you now. This is just event A. Probability of me pulling out a black sock. Well, probability of A is going to be equal to number of possible outcomes we're looking for, 8 over total possible outcomes. If you add these up, it gives you 20. A out of 20, also known as 2 fifths or 40%, 40% chance of pulling out a black sock. All right, 
What if I did the exact same thing, lights off, rummage around the sock drawer, pull out a sock, look at it, say, and I, 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 I turn on the lights for a moment, I say, oh, okay, that's a some, certain kind of sock. I turn the lights off, I put it back, rummage around again, mix everything up, and I pull out another sock, turn on the lights, and I look at that sock. What's the probability that both of the socks that I pulled out would be black? Here we have two events. And are they independent? Let's think about this. Does what I pulled out the first time influence what I pulled out the second time? Think about that. The answer is no, because I replaced it. I replaced the sock, and then I rummaged around again. I mixed it up again. So what I pulled out the second time has no bearing on what I, uh, what I pulled out the first time has no bearing on what I pulled out the second time. So our probability, then, it's independent events, so I can just multiply them together. This is going to be my first event, which we're calling A. The first pull is going to be 8 out of 20. And the second pull is also going to be 8 out of 20, probability of them both being black. And so that's going to be equal to something like 16%. You can work it out on your own. All right, here, here's the last twist. This time, I'm going to rummage around the sock drawer, pull out a sock, look at it, but then I'm not going to replace it. I'm going to rummage around the sock drawer again and pull out another sock. Now I want to know the probability of both of the socks that I pulled out of the drawer being black. Think about this for a moment. Is this going to be an in independent event? or is this, are, are these independent events or not? The answer, actually, you know what? What I'd really like for you to do is to solve this one on your own. So pause the video and, and do this. Figure out what you think the probability of pulling both socks out if I don't replace the first one. Anyway, sorry. Probability of both socks being black for my pull if I don't pull that if I don't replace the first one. Think about that for a moment. The answer is probability of pulling a black sock on the first attempt is of course eight out of twenty. That hasn't changed. The probability of pulling a black sock out on the second attempt is going to be seven, because that's how many black socks are left out of nineteen, because now I only have nineteen possible pairs in the drawer that I can choose from. So that's going to be equal to 56 over 380, which I'm not going to simplify. Um, because I'm multiplying 8 times 7, 20 times 19. And so that is an example of dependent events because they influence each other. What I pulled out on the first time influences what I'm going to get the second time. And this would be true even if I had said my second poll is going to be a red sock. I've changed, this, the, I've changed from 20 possible outcomes to, to 19. So that's going to affect the probability. Um, one last thing I want to point out. And that is this, that the equation I gave you earlier for independent events this, is, this equation is true if A and B are independent, can actually be used to check for independence. And we're going to look at that in the next video. The next video is going to be about conditional probability. Conditional probability is dealing with events that are dependent and figuring out the probability of we'll call it the second event or another event occurring if the first one is true. So if we say, if A has already happened, what's the probability of getting B in, for this de these dependent events? The, the fact that we got A is going to influence the probability of B, and it's all about figuring out that probability. We've done some dependent events like the sock drawer that, are, drawer that are pretty easy to figure out the probability of B. It can get a little bit more complicated sometimes. So conditional probability is all about saying, okay, do we have dependent events here? If so, we can use the way of thinking about conditional probability to figure out the probability of B in this um, compound probability um, situation that we have here. And this equation here can actually be a test of independence. Okay, lots to keep in mind. We'll get into this more in the next video.